Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan show. I'm delighted you could join us this week. My intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all around the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. And we have a special Thanksgiving treat for you this week. Arizona Bell is our sweet treat. And she, I have asked her to join us when I was thinking about who to have on the Thanksgiving show. She's the first one that came to mind. And I know as we get into this, you'll see why. So Arizona, welcome to the show. I'm honored to be here, Julie. Thank you so much. I know you've been on my podcast many times. And so it's a pleasure to be on yours now. So let me give you the formal introduction for Arizona. Let me put on my glasses here so I can see what I'm reading. Arizona Bell is the co-founder and CEO of Spirit Guides Media, a grief coach and afterlife activist. Arizona is an inspirational speaker with the message that examining death and what happens to us after death is the absolute best way to live our richest, most meaningful lives here on earth. Her podcast, A Matter of Life and Death, offers enlightened conversations with important voices in the worlds of spirituality, philosophy, and psychology, and her new book, Soul Magic, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Mystics, is a treasure trove of centuries-old secrets that will enrich all areas of your life. So, Arizona, what a girl. You are the wisest young person I know on the planet. And you appeal to millennials from people age group of millennials to centenarians, which is really remarkable when I think about it. And I know, thank you so much. I've been a guest on your show a couple of times and we've talked about the whole life and what happens as we're transitioning and all of that. So I'll put in the show notes, everybody, how you can find those past shows that Arizona and I did together. But today, what I want to do is I want to talk about other kinds of woo-woo and spiritual stuff, because I know that you have expertise in a lot of areas. So that's where I want to go. So it should be a fun discussion. <laughs> well, I want to first thank you for that amazing intro and for your kind words. That that really means a lot to me coming from you, because you're somebody that I value the opinion of so much. So I really, really appreciate that. I'm interested in how did you come to be so wise? Tell, tell us about your young life as a child. Did you grow up in a commune chanting under crystals in a yurk? Or were you raised in a traditional home? How does a person like you develop these skills that are so far beyond your years from a spiritual standpoint? I did not grow up in a yurt. I did not grow up in any way, shape, or form in a spiritual or religious family. In fact, my parents were both forced Catholics in their younger days. So they were of the generation saying, do what you want. You know, we're not going to force any religion. I did. Uh, I was in a, a Christian school for like four years because they had great daycare. That's about it. I asked too many questions, you know, so they put me in timeout a lot and and things like that. I, I said, how could Moses part the Red Sea? That doesn't make sense. So I, I didn't fit quite in. However, I did kind of come out as, as you said, an old soul. I remember my mom's friends who were kind of more hippie and stuff coming around and being like, Maria, Arizona, such an old soul. So I remember hearing that quote unquote old soul from, from very, very early on. I didn't know what it meant, but that's something that I, I have heard a lot. And I just remember being young and, you know, my parents were divorced when I was eight and my brother is 12 years older than me. So it was really just me and my mom and my mom after my dad, she was single. So it was just us. We were kind of like this team. And I remember just being a young person who always wanted to be at the adult table and they would forget that I was that young sometimes they, you know, and they'd forget they were talking about these big topics. And I just always felt remembering like, I feel like I'm 35 years old. I don't want to go play with all those kids. So that that's just kind of how I came out. That was kind of my demeanor. I, I came out with um, an attraction to the esoteric, I guess you would say. And uh, but I, I grew up in the suburbs of Phoenix in a very conservative town, just like normal, normal as it gets pretty much. And I was just always kind of the oddball. I was the the creative 
you know, kind of out there person. And yeah, so my, my upbringing wasn't anything magical in that regard. I just, I kind of just always been that way. Everyone comes in with intuitive gifts and this is what I teach. It's learning to develop and enhance those gifts. And, and I think that all of us probably around the age of about six or seven, we start to shut down our gifts. And then some of us are led to bring them back up and utilize them in a multitude of ways. I had a attraction to the spiritual path, but it was always sort of a dabbling because I was very much living in a mainstream world. So I it was never full on in that regard. Um, and so my mom was diagnosed with cancer when I was 27. And and passed away a couple years later in the middle of my Saturn return for anybody who follows astrology. And I was, what does it mean when you say Saturn return for those of us that aren't experts on us on astrology? Can you explain what that is and how it affects your life? Sure. So around 29, there's a little bit of a, a shadow period, but around age 29 and every 29 years we go through what is called a Saturn return which is basically where Saturn is in the sky where you were born. It takes 29 years to get back there. And Saturn's kind of the taskmaster taskmaster of the planets, kind of the uh, tough lesson kind of planet. So when you do go through your Saturn return, it is a tougher time, quote unquote, in your life because Saturn basically shakes up your life and says anything that's not in alignment with your highest spiritual path, you know, you're going to have, we're going to shake that up now and you're going to, you're going to be redirected, I guess, through sometimes hard lessons. And the interesting thing about that for me was I was going through my first Saturn return when my mom passed away and my mom was going through her second Saturn return when she passed away. And both of our Saturns are in Scorpio and Scorpio is the zodiac sign of death, rebirth, and transformation. And that's really, really rare that we are both in it in both of the same planet. So taking that just to kind of, I know I'm on a tangent now, but to me, it was written in the stars that this was going to happen, that my mom was going to pass away and it was going to be a major rebirth for both of us. And for me, uh, for sure in, in this world. So my mom's death was a game changer for me. It changed my entire life to answer your question. I didn't, I don't, I didn't know anybody who had lost a parent my age and or anybody that they were really, really close to. I didn't, and I had no experience with death at all. You know, I had lost my childhood dog and that was terrible. That was it. I hadn't lost grandparents, nothing. And so my first loss with zero tools or information to deal with it was my primary caregiver, the love of my life. Me and my mom were best friends, you know? we It was just me and her. How do you lose your best friend and your caregiver and your mom at a young age, how do you navigate that and when you didn't have any experience? And it sounds like you didn't really have anybody else to lean on. Tell us about that time in your life. I can only imagine it was excruciating. Yeah, we were best friends, best friends to the point where people were afraid for my survival. <laughs> it was just it was a shock and it was it was frankly terrible. And how did I navigate it? Well, to be completely honest, on my mom's deathbed, because she had cancer, she did die a slow death. I got to say goodbye to her. And she said, baby, don't despair. Don't despair. And in my last rebellion to my mother, I did. <laughs> I totally despaired. I, gosh, I'm going to, tearing up now, but for a year, I just completely that's all I did. I despaired. I didn't do, I was depressed. I was suicidal. I didn't do anything with my life that was healthy. I didn't know how to go on. I didn't. And the one thing that I always had that was like my saving grace in any tough time was creativity and writing. And that was my connection to spirit. And even that was severed at the time. So I really was just, I was, I was out in the sea with no lifeboat, you know, and it was a, a hurricane. It was bad. And it was so bad that I, I reached the moment of surrender that I needed to reach to, to transform that grief really into, and to alchemize it into 
creativity again. And so I, about a year after my mom died, I had this moment where I just had the sincerest prayer where I just dropped to my knees and I cursed at God. And I said, what the F do you want me to do? How, you know, I, I just, I, I said my prayer. I said, if you need me to continue on, you need to show me what you need me to do. And, and I will do whatever you want me to do. And it was my moment of the deepest surrender. And I woke up the next day and it was like a whole new energy, a whole new me, a whole new everything. I knew what I needed to do. I need, knew where I needed to go, who I needed to be with. I knew everything was clear where for the whole year I had no clarity. It was a, it was that catalyst moment for me and it changed my entire life forward after that. How did the information come in for you? You know, I'm a businesswoman, so I'm thinking business plan. You got measurables, you try something. Are you reaching your goals in increments or did everything, did you have the path just laid out in front of you and you knew where you were going to be or did you get it in step by step by step? How did that all come into you from spirit? It was a overall big picture plan was given to me. And so the idea for my company, Spirit Guides Media, I was given that information in a meditation about three years before my mom even passed away. But I was not at a point in my life to do it. I had the name Spirit, at the time it was magazine, Spirit Guides Magazine. The tagline was new maps for old souls. There's that old soul again. I had it all, but I did not have the confidence to do it. So the the gift in grief for me was to really see, oh my gosh, life really is short. And I have had this idea in my head for three plus years because it's meant for me. So when I had that surrender moment, I woke up and I knew I needed to do spirit guides because I need to needed to help other people who were feeling lonely and lost and grieving like I was. I needed to provide that those new maps for old souls because there was a void there as far as business. There's a void in the spiritual world for younger people. And of course, what I do now, I, I talk to all people and I reach all people. But we did start with the idea of being, you know, I'm a millennial. So I, I wanted spirituality to be a hip. I wanted it to be accessible. And there was this void that wasn't doing that at the time many years ago. And so I was like, I just fully understand. Spirit gave me the big picture. I didn't get the water, I didn't get the detailed step by step. I just knew the big picture and the next step I needed. I didn't have all the steps. I had to continue to have faith and trust and spirit to get all the steps as, as I progressed forward. So. Yeah, I agree on that because for me, I've done lots of companies. I mean, how does a girl with a communications degree invent surgical devices sold throughout the world? The people that I needed to show up showed up when I needed them. And at this stage in my life, really for a couple of decades, I just expect that to happen. And it always does, regardless of whatever it is I'm doing. I just trust that I'm going to be led step by step. I know what the end result is. And I trust that I'm going to get the information when I need it to move forward. The other thing I think that's important to remember is we have a free will and we have lots of other people's free will and future events are fluid. So there are a bazillion variables that are coming into play when we're talking about future events. And when we try and think too far in advance of how everything's going to unfold, not only do we limit ourselves to the things that can come up that we haven't thought of, but it's also just too overwhelming. Our human minds don't have the capacity to envision all of those variables. So take it a step at a time, trust that everything's gonna unfold perfectly, and it does. Absolutely. I mean, I've never thought about it in those terms. I've never been asked that direct question, but my gut is yes. I mean, because it's that feeling of something's missing. And I just don't believe that without a, a spiritual connection, a spiritual anchoring, that anybody would be, could really honestly say that they were totally fulfilled. I find the same thing, even with people who are crusty and say, well, I just don't believe in that stuff. And usually linear thinkers and I'll, I'll say, oh, well, that's fine. And, and then I'll change the subject and then they'll come back and they'll want to talk some more. And I also find that people who say, well, the Bible is against talking to spirits. And I'll say, really? The angel appeared to Joseph and told him to take Jesus and Mary back a different route. 
you know, to, to avoid Herod. And the angel appeared to Mary and said, you're going to conceive and you're going to have a child and you need to call him Jesus. And Moses was talking to a burning bush. And I find that all these ancient texts that are that are spiritual of angels and saints and other other spirits talking. So I think it's been around since the beginning of time. And and when I'll say to somebody, well, maybe maybe this just isn't for you. Boy, they come back in a in a hard way. Yeah, my, all if not most for sure. Yeah, and you know, just on your note, look at Jesus. He was the ultimate energy healer and medium and everything, really. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that I find that's really funny is people will say to me, well, I don't believe in talking to spirits and they'll be real holy, you know, real holy rollers. And I'll say, well, do you pray? And I'll say, of course I pray. And I'll say, well, to whom are you praying? And they'll say Jesus or the Virgin Mary or some saint or Buddha or whomever. And I'll say, oh, is Buddha sitting on a couch with you when you're talking to him? They'll say, well, no, that's different. It's not different. It's the same thing. You're talking to spirit. And I always like to ask the question, do you get an answer? And they, by then they are wanting to change the topic. It's really pretty funny to talk to people about it because people are genuinely curious to know more. Let's talk about your new book. I love the title, Soul Magic ancient wisdom for modern mystics. Do you believe that all cultures have some sort of a proprietary way that they reach spirit through their traditions and their rituals and their talismans and things like that? Is, is that what's contained in the book? Tell us a little bit about, about what your thoughts are and, and how you've covered it in your new book. Yeah, basically, uh, you know, the tagline, I'll show it to you here for the people on video. It's a really pretty book too. It makes yeah. for great it's coffee pretty. table stuff, but the tagline's ancient wisdom for modern mystics. And it is, it's a primer for these ancient, uh, we have 17 that we cover ancient modalities of ways to connect with spirit and, and healing and all of those things. And it, it covers these 17 topics as, as a primer and an amalgamation, as you said. And I do believe that, you know, it's, it's long been said that the core of every religion, you know, is the same and that's love. And so these are just ways to connect and amplify that love. And that's kind of like going back to your original question on, you know, people are going to feel unfulfilled if they don't have that ultimate source of love in their life in some way, in faith, in some way, right? And trust in this bigger system that's going on. So yeah, my book, Soul Magic, is is um, kind of an amalgamation of all of these different ways. And you can kind of choose your journey, you know, like choose your adventure. It's like some of these things work for you and some of them don't. And these are just kind of entry points into the world of spirit and what works for you works for you. So you can kind of see what's best for what resonates with you best, I guess. I find it fascinating how pagan symbols have been utilized by religions throughout the years and the millennia to have a different meaning, but the root oftentimes is brought through in the new meaning. For instance, in preparation to get ready to talk to you today in preparation for this interview, I looked up the pagan symbol for the cross and I find out, found out that it represents fertility, which I thought was interesting because Christians see a cross and they think Jesus died on the cross and it's a symbol for Christianity. But when I found out that it was the symbol for fertility. I thought, well, rebirth, birthing, rebirth, all of that. I got goosebumps when I read that information. And I was raised Catholic and I'm a practicing Catholic and went through 12 years of Catholic schools. And my God, the incense. Oh, I remember being in the first grade and sitting in the front pew. And I thought, I am going to pass out from this smell. And I thought, they're going to have to take me to the hospital in the ambulance. And the doctor on his written report is going to say, this child passed out because she smelled too much incense. So do you find that there are other symbols that started out as pagan symbols and now they're utilized in our lives and perhaps for the same meaning or a different meaning? Yes, that's exactly what's in the book on each chapter. We kind of go through the origin story of each thing, you know, like there was a, as you speak of incense, there was a famous like, uh, you know, 
path where all of this stuff was traded back in ancient, ancient days, ancient Egypt, all this stuff. And they were, they were transporting frankincense, which was like more than gold back then. And well, that's what's burning in all of these temples now is frankincense still to this day. So yeah, we talk about the origins of them and, and why that matters and, and how it's still in effect today and how you can use it in your own life, because these things are there, they've been there for, they're timeless for a reason because they work. And even today, I find that people your age and even younger are really into saging rooms or saging buildings or saging homes. Do you think that that's kind of a new adaptation of a very old tradition? And is it the same thing? Is it part of a ritual? And some of them don't really even know what they're doing. They just think it's cool to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this stuff is from the indigenous people that, you know, and we're talking sage and, and, and all the indigenous tribes and Native Americans, and it's sacred to them. And, you know, just on that note, we talk a little bit on that in the book of how it's being now it's all these hip spiritual kids are saging everything anywhere they go. And, you know, there's a sacredness to it that we have to keep in mind too. It's not about just light sage whenever you get into the house. It, it is a ceremonial thing. And so it is, it is adapting for new times. And as we say, modern mystics, this stuff is just as accessible to them too. But we, and I think the important thing in this book, when I was writing it and researching for it too, was keeping in mind that sacred tradition where it comes from and honoring that and not just doing these things because it, it sounds cool or looks cool or it makes a cool Instagram post. You know what I mean? Um, Cause Sage is very beautiful in an Instagram story when it's burning, but it's, there's a sacredness to it that we want to carry through and, and keep that reverence too. What's the deal with crystals? I know crystals are really popular and I know people say to me every once in a while, so do you use crystals in your healing? No, that's not how I work. How I work and how I teach is you just use your head connect to spirit, boom, doing the healing, doing whatever. And I know the kids are really interested in crystals and so are other people too. So talk to us about crystals. What, what's their, their appeal? Are they really useful? Just educate us on the crystal thing. Sure. So I actually agree with you that you don't need anything. We are directly able to plug right in. Right. But Things like crystals and talismans and all of that and the rituals around them all, they're just amplifiers. So, and who doesn't want some amplifying help every once in a while? And plus, crystals are really pretty. So to have them all over your home, you've got a gorgeous home and they're amplifying your intention, basically. So you can program a crystal or a talisman or a pen. I mean, it could be any of those things, but crystals are very high vibrational. So they are able to pro you're able to program your intention into them. And if you keep that crystal near you and around you, it will amplify. So that's, those are what these things are being used for. They're just tools to help on the journey towards spirit. But I agree with you at the very core of it. All you need is if you were alone in a room with nothing else, and you just had your functioning mind and your body, you're able to do this. So all of these other things, they're tools and Reminders, because we do kind of need to be reminded sometimes about the discipline that comes with spirituality. What do you mean by discipline in spirituality? What does that mean to you? I mean, I, you can know all the things. I could read all of the books about spirituality and have all of the knowledge in my head. But there, for me personally, I found that I do need a certain discipline where I do need to, I do, it makes my life work better when I continue that conversation I made with spirit in the original surrender prayer, where, what do you need me to do? So it, things like prayer and meditation. And if I do a little altar ritual for my ancestors, those things help me stay disciplined and remember every day that I'm dedicating my life to spirit. I guess that's what I mean. It's a reminder. When you're talking about programming crystals and talismans, what does that mean? What do you mean by programming those items? I don't know that I've ever heard that before. Literally just intention. Some people go, some people put them under the moonlight to charge them under the moonlight or all kinds of different ways of charging them. But intention, intention, I have a crystal right here. I'll show you. It's like, this is my crystal and I'm putting my, I'm programming it by putting my intention into it. I'm speaking my intention into it. This crystal is going to remind me that my intention is I want to serve the world this way. Do you think that's part of the programming of those 
items? I don't think people know enough to program these kinds of items. Or do you think it's just some some item that's picking up the energy of the person that uses it a lot or that wears that ring a lot? I mean, I think it's all, all, everything's subconscious programming. So yeah, if you have somebody that has a rosemary and they're praying into it every day or however often for their whole life, yeah, that's programming it. A rosemary? That's called a rosary. It's not a rosemary. I know it's called a rosary. Did I say rosemary? That's funny. But yeah. um, So yeah, that's absolutely programming into your rosemary. That's funny. We do talk about rosemary in the book as an herb too, but yes. So yeah, that's that's absolutely... um, programming. And, um, you know, that's the, I think they call it psychometry where you can pick up an object and kind of read the energy too. So all of that is, is definitely a thing. Yeah. Tell us about some of the favorite things you talk about in the book with what the applications are for them. So for instance, Rosemary, does it have just a medicinal purpose or spiritual or both? How does that work? And give us a couple of examples of things that you discuss in the book. Yeah. You know, we have a list of different herbs that, um, on, and their properties for both physical and spiritual healing. So that's pretty cool. So you have the physical elements, like with rosemary, it's like improves memory and improves the, your hair condition and your, you know, things like that. And, and then there's the spiritual components as well, which I can't remember off the top of my head actually with rosemary, but that we have all of these listed out in there with all those different components. And it's really, really interesting. I know they used to say, I think it's, you put witches would put rosemary outside of their door to pr- protect their homes and their, their families. So there's all kinds of things that, that these, these esoteric meanings behind these herbs and things, but then it's good for your body too. So yeah, we talk about that. We have a whole chapter about herbalism. So herbalism and crystals and what are some of the other things that you cover? Yeah. So we have, I mean, it's really across the gamut. We have aromatherapy, crystals, herbs, we have mediumship, we have spirit communication, we have sacred pilgrimage and travel. We have even Sabbath, a day of rest. We talk about literally across the board, yoga, meditation, all kinds of things that are ancient in origin. That brings to mind a story. One day I was getting a facial and the gal that does my facials is a riot. She's just hilarious. And we were talking about different herbs and natural plants and things. And I said, oh, I forget what she mentioned. And I said, oh, that makes me break out. My skin doesn't like that. And she said, well, just because it's natural doesn't mean that you want to rub it on your face. You're not going to rub poison ivy all over your face. It was hysterical. Let's talk a little now about healing places, places that are special because they have vortexes or some something going on that draws people to them. As you know, I live in Birmingham, Alabama, and there's a place here called Gravity Hill. And Gravity Hill is a, a, a hill that goes down to a state highway. And when you put the car at the bottom of the hill at the stop sign in, in neutral, gravity pulls the car back up the hill. And so a couple of Thanksgivings ago, we were at my daughter-in-law Mallory's great aunt's house near Gravity Hill, about an hour from here. And Jonathan, my son and Tim, my husband, I said, oh, we got to go to Gravity Hill. And they're going, yeah. And Jonathan said, mom, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, come on, come on, come on, let's go. So we did. I had Tim put the car in neutral and I promise you, it pulled the car back up the hill five miles an hour. And so we did it three times. And of course I needed to scan it to find out what was going on. I thought, well, is there an Indian burial ground there or what's going on? And what I found was, yes, there was an Indian burial ground further down the road, but this was just a vortex that was on top of this hill. And all these academic people have come to Birmingham to study Gravity Hill. Even if you do it on your GPS, if you you Google it, Gravity Hill will come up in Alabama. And I just thought that was wild. So what's your experience with that, with sacred places? Um, yeah, you know, I lived in Sedona, Arizona for three plus years and, you know, that's, that's like the most famous vortex place in the world, one of them. And totally that's where the, that's where the indigenous people settled. And you know why you just know when you go there. And, and so I, I understand that. And I've, and even where I just lived in Mallorca, Spain, as you know, that was a, that whole Island, not a lot of people know that is built on a bed of crystal 
quartz, which is a, a crystal, the entire thing. And so the, the entire island is this massive energy field. And everybody who lives there in Majorca and also in Sedona knows that. And, and they say, they say Sedona and or Majorca will, it will kind of give you the boot. It'll kick you out energetically if you're not in the vibration of that massive energy, which is difficult to do. So it, you, when you move to places like this with the, these huge energy vortexes, you're going to go through stuff and you're going to stuff's going to come up in your life and it, to ultimately heal you. But it's, it's for your spiritual advancement. And that's what places like that do. I lived a mile from a vortex in Sedona and I, when I would drive down to Phoenix to visit my mom, I could feel the shift in energy by the time I got to my home. Like there's no question about it. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm in a different, totally different vibration right now. So it's, it's pretty interesting. It's invisible. And it's like, how can this be? But it's, it's, I felt it. Back to the topic of spiritual places in school, of course, in Catholic school, I learned about Lourdes, France and Fatima, Portugal, where the Virgin Mary appeared to the children or whomever. And I found that was interesting. And when I was, again, preparing for this interview today, I looked up Lourdes and I found out that there was a pagan temple there and it was the temple to the God of water which I thought was interesting. Have you found much of that in uh, your research of some of these different places around the world that are healing places or places with a lot of energy connected to them? I had not read that before. I did not research that. That's interesting. And then of course there's Stonehenge in England. And have you ever been there that I've read that it dates back to 3000 BC? Yeah, something yeah. like that. And it's it's still as magical as ever. And people gather there for every solstice and event, planetary event you could think of. And then of course, there's Avalon, which is thought to be the modern day Glastonbury in England. And uh, that is of King Arthur and the Round Table and Camelot legend. Have you been there or do you know anybody that's been there? I do. I know many people, some of my best friends, because again, when I was living in Spain, I was on an island where there was a lot of UK expats and they were all into all that stuff. And in fact, when we started Spirit Guides magazine way back, one of our first articles, because we used to do travel articles to sacred sites, just like we're, we're discussing today. And we also discuss in the book, Sacred Sites. And somebody wrote an article about their pilgrimage to Avalon. And it was just, it opened my mind and my eyes to it, like, because I hadn't had much knowledge about it. And so, again, on my list, I kind of kicked myself in the butt for being over in Europe for so long and not making it there. But I've heard it's very magical. And then there's the lady in the lake, lady of the lake in Avalon. And that's supposed to be the spirit that heals people, that healed King Arthur and heals others and uh, that myth. And have you seen Frozen 2? I have not seen Frozen 2. I saw Frozen 1 a lot more than I ever wanted to, but I, I have not seen the second one. I've seen Frozen 2 four times. And the animation and the music and the story and all of that is just so magical. And it's so, uh, it touched me so much that I use it in my curriculum and the classes that I teach. So I highly recommend that you watch it. And they have a great, documentary about the movie being made and how it, even down to the last month or six weeks before the movie was supposed to premiere, they were still working on the story and the animations. And I thought, oh my gosh, how did those guys survive that? But it is really terrific. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. You can get it for about nine bucks at Target or you can watch it on Netflix or I guess it's on Disney Plus. So. All right. The other place that I find fascinating is the Camino de Santiago, which is the pilgrimage from the French Pyrenees to, I think it ends up at the Cathedral of St. James in Spain. Isn't that right? Yes, I have. And I think it's a month pilgrimage, but, and I think there are several different routes that somebody can take through the mountains and on this path. And it's interesting because it was, and again, in my research to prepare for this chat today, I found that it was originally an ancient route that the Romans used for trade. And now pilgrims use it to end up at the cathedral. Yes, exactly. I have a very good friend who did the whole thing. And 
her her uh, account of the transformation that she went through is just incredible. I actually had her write an article about it because it was so moving. Um, and I almost did that. I was going to I was going to sign up and well sign myself up, not like you have to sign a list, but I was going to commit to that. But you know, good old COVID came and struck us, struck us all. So, but uh, I'm doing it one day. And we write about that in the book as well as one of the sacred pilgrimages, because I mean, pilgrim, pilgrimage is a, it's an ancient journey or an ancient modality for people to, to get into the spiritual mindset and path because you're, it's just you and the land and spirit. That's what it's about. And your, your dedication to that. And, and, any any time you go on on a journey like that it, today you could go on a modern pilgrimage pilgrimage i i bought an rv and traveled all of america and that to me was a spiritual pilgrimage i did that after my mom passed away but yes the camino is amazing so was it a trade route because there was a spiritual component to it or was it a trade route because that's what they took. And then the spiritual came in later. It's the old chicken and the egg thing. What do you think about that? I feel like back in ancient times, everything had a spiritual component. Mm -hmm. So I would, I, I believe all of those trails and, and the ancient routes were, were intended because of, they probably went through spiritual centers and that was intended. One of my friend's sons just did the Camino last year and he, he didn't really pick up much spiritual thing, uh, things from it, but he, I think, got sick of staying in hostels and stayed in a hotel near the end of it. But the one who really introduced me to it first was Shirley MacLaine and all the experiences that she had when she was on as far as spiritual things that were really miraculous that happened to her. And I saw her on Oprah, and I think she wrote a book about it, too. I'm sure I read the book. And uh, God bless Shirley MacLaine. God bless Shirley yeah. MacLaine and all of her work in the spiritual world. Who would have thought? Yeah, it was Shirley who introduced me to past lives and woo-woo long before I really even knew that it existed, let alone had studied any of it. So I am very grateful to her and Oprah for having that on TV because that was really revolutionary to be talking about that kind of thing on TV back in the, it's probably, I guess, the... 80s, the mid 80s, perhaps. And I remember her being on Oprah and talking about that and I and her spiritual experiences as she went for the month, you know, in different places, even to the point of seeing packs of wild dogs that were coming at her and she was able to communicate with them. Wow. And they laughed and they I think they tell you to walk it alone if you can, right? Yeah. Yes, they do tell you to walk it alone. And the friend I know that went on ended up meeting people here and there. Of course, you're on a trail with other people. And, you know, they'd, they'd come into companionship for a little while. But then there was, she kind of relayed that there was this pulling that she wanted to be alone too. Like, it was mm -hmm. kind of like, hi, nice to meet you. And let's have a night where we all, you know, sp spend some good cheer together. But I need to do this alone. So, yeah, I, I feel like those things are powerful when you're able to kind of roll solo for a while. And then how, how do you feel about the significance of the Camino ending up at the Cathedral of St. James? Because that is certainly one of the largest cathedrals in all of Europe. And my research said that it was built in the ninth century. And uh, so what do, you, what do you think that's all about? The bigger the cathedral, the more the significance, you know, that is that is how it was measured in ancient times is the the, you know, because it, it was no small feat to make these large, massive cathedrals and beautiful and the details in them are astonishing. You know, in the modern world, we can't even fathom how much effort went into that. And it was it was a spiritual offering. So. The, when you end up at this massive cathedral, St. James in this case, it's it's honoring all of the energy that's gone into these pilgrimages and your spiritual, all of the people that have walked the spiritual path before you and have honored this these spiritual principles. I mean, the energy in that cathedral is, it's unmeasurable. It's outstanding. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I've 
gotten interested in recently is the Bosnian pyramids. Are you familiar with them? Have you heard anything about those? Only peripherally. So no, you tell me. Yeah, there was an archaeologist named Sam Osmanovich or something like that, a Russian archaeologist. And he was visiting Bosnia and he saw this hill that was a perfect pyramid. He said, that's no hill. It was a pyramid that was covered with vegetation. So he, they started excavating and doing the big dig and they found three pyramids and they are really remarkable and they are twice the age of the Egyptian pyramids. I think the Egyptian pyramids are five or 6,000 years old and these Bosnia ones are maybe 12,000 years old. Wow. And there have been many scholars that have gone and and corroborated the information that Dr. Sam has gotten and and where they're positioned from a latitudinal and longitudinal perspective is very significant. And apparently they have healing powers. People who have visited the pyramids that have medical issues like high blood pressure, they'll go in and they'll spend an hour and they'll come out later and they'll their blood pressure will be perfect or people with high blood sugar levels again, they'll come out and they'll be perfect. And they have underground tunnels in them that uh, work to help heal. And they apparently have scalar waves that they've been able to calculate what it makes the vibration of the inside of the pyramids. And Dr. Sam thinks that the pyramids were an early type of a cosmic internet system with people from other planets. And I know you love that kind of stuff too. Absolutely. And apparently there are pyramids all over the world. I didn't know that. I mean, I knew of the ones in Mexico and I knew of the one, I know of the ones in Egypt. Obviously that's what a lot of us thought, think of first when we think of a pyramid, but certainly the Aztec ones are pyramids as well. And, uh, and so it's interesting that he talks about his hypothesis is that this is some type of a communication system with aliens and with other beings, which who knows, but it's feasible. Yeah. So let's talk about dreams and visitations. They, as we mentioned before, they're in all the ancient texts and really run, a, there's a current that runs through all cultures and civilizations about angels and visits from spirits and guidance and all of that. So what is a dream visit? What's a dream visit? So a dream visit is when either you can arrange a dream visit or it can happen totally spontaneously, but a dream visit would be when one of your loved ones who has passed one of your loved ones in the light or even a spirit guide or an angel or anybody on your spirit team, as I call it, comes to you, visits you in a dream to relay messages to you, to relay love to you, to relay um, assurances to you that they are still with you, that they don't really die. They're still always with you. Um, and these are not dreams. They're, they're different. They're actually hanging out with these energies, these people, whoever they are um, in the astral realm. So that's, that's what a dream visit is. And, you know, for instance, I, I, I thought I'd have a dream visit from my mom immediately after she passed away because I thought I was already into all this. I knew it could happen, but I didn't for, for months and months. And I was pissed. I was like, mom, why aren't you coming to me in my dream? You know? Um, but I'll never forget the first time that she did. And there wasn't even words said, and it, you just woke up and you knew it wasn't a dream. It, it didn't have that feeling of a dream. It wasn't like all over the place. It was, nope, this is mom. And she's come to just hold me and, you know, pat my head and let me cry in her arms and, and, and communicate to me that she's with me every single day. And you just know it's different. I describe it as a, a, a super high def experience, high definition experience. The colors are more vibrant. The smells are more pungent. You may have goosebumps. You may have the hair on, your, on the back of your neck standing up. And it's because when our spirits attach to a body, we vibrate at a, at a slower rate simply because the body has mass. So you're feeling the vibration of somebody that's in non-physical and they're vibrating in a, at a much higher rate. And it feels 
different. And it, that's what produces the goosebumps. Some people call that angel bumps. I talk about that in my book, Angelic Attendance, what really happens as we transition from this life into the next about how our deceased loved ones are there for us as we're, we're getting close to death and even the spirits of deceased pets and angels. And it's a riot because these spirits show up in period dress. I'll see people dressed in Renaissance garb and people from the 1960s and go-go boots and mini skirts and people from the 40s and 50s. And they look like they're from the TV show Mad Men. So they all show up in different forms. So I can recognize that they're from many past lives. The other interesting thing is there's a book called Death is But a Dream. And it's written by a, a guy named Dr. Chris Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R, and he's a hospice director in Buffalo. And he's researched a couple of thousand of his patients who I believe the number is 88 percent say that they see deceased loved ones either in dreams or in visits as they're approaching death. And so that book corroborates what I talk about in my book from the spiritual side of the equation. And my book validates what his talks about from the, the human in the research side of the equation. A fun story about a, a visit happened to my brother-in-law, Regis, my younger sister's widower husband. My sister died 10 years ago last week. And uh, a couple of years after she had died, Regis called and he said, I had this wild dream about Joan last night. And I said, really, tell me about it. And he went on to say that in the dream, he came downstairs and she was sitting on the couch in the living room and she said where, to him, where have you been? And he said, where have I been? Where have you been? You're dead. What are you doing here? And she, they had some conversation back and forth. And he said to me, it was so real. The colors were real. And the hair on the back of my neck was standing up and the hair on my arms was standing up. And it was just, it was an amazing dream. And then he went on to tell me that the next morning he came downstairs and he was walking through the main hallway and there's a closet there, a coat closet there. And he said the light was on. Well, the thing that's so bizarre about that is that closet housed all of my sister's coats and things. And he said, I've not been in that closet since she died and nobody's been in the house. So I don't know who turned on the light. And I said, well, she turned on the light. She was letting you know that she was there visiting you. It was a visit, not a dream. And that story, I think, is not only remarkable, but really heart, heart touching. You know, it's very touching that she came to visit him and, and he was able to recall that and know that she was around him and she was letting him know that. Yeah. You know, I've had some good friends that like professionally astral travel, I'll, I'll call it that. And I think that I've always had a tendency to do it without really understanding what was going on. But yeah, from what my understanding is, dreamland is real life. Some, you know, it's real life. And we go to bed and we recharge. We're traveling. We're talking to our people out there. We're, you know, we're still connected to our silver cord that keeps us alive. But we are literally traveling the different realms and we're, we're talking to our loved ones. We're going to get new information. I remember when I was first on my spiritual journey, like consciously, I just remember dreaming and traveling at night to visit teachers, spiritual teachers in the astral world that were like, these are the messages we want you to remember. These are the mess. Every night you have to train to remember to bring these messages back. And it was like my mission to bring the messages back. And of course, for the first many times I couldn't remember. And I, but it was like, I knew I went on a journey at night. It was not a dream. It was literally travel to learn while I was asleep. I think people are fascinated by astral travel. How can we do that when we're alive and then our spirit goes out and goes someplace else? And I, I know a lot of people have asked me about it over the years and it's, pretty fun to do. You don't have to be asleep to just do it either. You can do it when you're awake. That's called non-local reality. I know that you can train yourself to, to astral travel and you can practice just like any other spiritual modality. To me, it's been something that's happened naturally. Um, and I think that if I were to spend some time practicing it, I would be actually pretty advanced at it because it, it does come naturally to me. But the, my friends that do practice astral travel, literally professionally, they can train themselves to go where they want to go while they're asleep and they can, um, 
ma- they can, they're in control of it more or less. So it, I don't know how it works, but I find it also very, very fascinating. And I know that it does work. You talked about how you get messages from your dreams and you're supposed to convey them to others. How does that work for you? Do you write something down when you dream it or do you just remember it the next morning? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, like I said, when I was first having these experiences, um, it was hard for me to remember coming back. And I think we all kind of can experience that even in dreams, regular dreams, like it's, it's hard to remember. And I just remember this feeling of, I need to remember the messages to bring back. And after, after, you know, astral traveling in my dreams enough, I've kind of practiced as well. And, and now I'm able to remember more. And, and it's kind of like, you know, when somebody gets a meditation download and, you know, they're meditating and then they come out of meditation and they're like, oh, this is the title for my new book, or this is the decision I need to make that I was confused about. It's the same thing with astral travel. It's these, these answers to your questions and these messages that you or humanity need to hear being transmitted to you and bringing them back into this waking life. I mean, we have a team on the other side that are helping us every night. That's my understanding is we have teams helping us as we recharge and sleep. They're, they're coaching us on the other side, how to best bring those messages and information to our waking life. Well, and I think too, when we're asleep, it quiets our monkey minds. So we're not uh, worried about things or in a low vibrational state because spirit can communicate when we're in a high vibrational state, when we're awake. But if we're depressed or feeling something negative, it's a different frequency of a station. It's like trying to listen to classic rock on the talk news station. They're not going to have it or vice versa. So when we're in a sleeping state, we're even neutral and spirit can come through and communicate with us. I find that early in the morning when I'm starting to wake up, I'm not all the way awake yet, but as I'm waking up, that is a time when I get a lot of what I call divine downloads. Information will just be there, boom. And I'll remember it when I wake up and and it will be guidance The other thing that's interesting is non-local reality. And I teach this in my class too. And it reminds me of when I was a kid, I used to love to watch Bewitched and Bewitched Samantha Stevens would snap her fingers and she'd be in a different location. And now I can do that and all my students can do it too. And, And, you know, the CIA and Google and Apple and pretty much every intelligence agency around the world, they have people that can do what's called non-local reality and they can go to a different part of the world in addition to the satellite dishes and the satellites that we have that receive information, but they can go to telepathically to a different location and see things like what kind of missiles do they have and where are they and come up with latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates and things like that. So I find that's really interesting, not only from a military and a national security standpoint, but also from a developmental standpoint of new gadgets and new devices, a new phone, a new way to communicate, all of that. So how does one set up astral travel? What's the the, uh, procedure that somebody has to go through when they want to do astral travel? Do they just come up with a game plan and then they think of it and then it happens? Can you describe to us how that works? Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just like with crystals, everything for me comes down to intention. I, when I am trying to say, utilize the astral travel experience or the dreamland experience to solve a problem or, or come up with an idea that I need or anything like that, or, or for instance, meet my mom in dreamland if I want to see my mom. Now it's about not just hoping it happens whenever, of course, sometimes it does spontaneously happen, right? But it's going to bed with the intention of, hey, mom, I'd like to meet you in my dreams tonight. Or hey, spirit guide, master spirit guide, I'd like an answer to this question. So my tip is to to meditate before bed, first of all, in, in that get into that space, or if you don't want to call it meditation, just get into a relaxed space because 
that's where our subconscious mind right before bed is so impressionable and, and stating your intention that you want the answer to this question to come to you in dreamland, or you want to meet this person in dreamland, the intention, it makes all the difference. I do that as an early alarm. If I'm catching an early flight or need to get up early, early, of course, I'll set my alarm on my phone too, but I'll say, okay, I need to get up at 3.45 a.m. Central time. And sure enough, I'll wake up at that time. It's remarkable how well it works. I think that's a good, good lead in to talk about deja vu and past lives. How does that work? And how does that affect our current life? And can it give guidance to our current life when we are able to access past lives and or we're somewhere and it feels really familiar and we know we've never been there before, but we know the area and we recognize things that there's no way we would know that. How does all that work? You know, everybody has their different theories on this, of course, you know, but I, I, I'm i under the impression and my, my understanding is that everything's happening all at the same time and that is so hard for our 3D human brains to understand, but yeah, we're multi-dimensional. We're, we're living multiple realities all at the same time and they all affect one another in the quantum field. And that's wild to think about, but it's true. And, and that's why, you know, even now, like psychologists are saying, if you heal your own trauma, you can heal your entire lineage of trauma because it, it has this ripple effect through the quantum field through all of time which I know it sounds so wild, but it's also so cool. And that is, that is my, that is what I believe. And, and, you know, with deja vu to me, my superstitious belief at least is that it, it to me signifies that I'm on the right track. I don't know what the real answer is, but to me, that is what I've always intuitively thought is when I have a moment of deja vu, it means that I'm where I need to be. That's how I understand it. Now, if it means that I'm not where I need to be, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. <laughs> I agree with you. Your point about multiple be realities being really hard to understand uh, is true because we don't have any frame of reference for that. But I know that I do instant replays a lot. And I, that's how I do past lives and how I can, it's kind of like when you're watching a football game and they, they're doing an instant replay of the touchdown, same concept with that. But spirits have a frequency that they keep throughout all of their lifetimes and how we connect to them is our heads are big satellite dishes and we just think of them and then we connect to them on that frequency so we can access any past life of our own. That's how we connect to spirit that spirits that are deceased, spirits that are alive. You know, we've all had situations where we think of somebody and then all of a sudden within a 24 hour period, they're calling us or they're texting us or they're sending us an email and we say, oh my gosh, what a coincidence. Well, no coincidence there. You're connecting with their spirit's frequency, their vibration, and, the, and they're responding and whether they're attached to a body or not. Yeah, I have a ton of stories about that. One of my favorites is I have a friend that lives in Nashville and and her uh, housing development is a, on a on land that was a plantation at one point. And in the, the lots are large and in the back right corner of her lot is a foundation, the remnants of a foundation. And there are graves both around this foundation and then also there's a wall and then there are more graves outside of the wall. So when she moved in, she said to me, oh, go scan that and tell, tell us what it is. And so I did. And what I saw was it was a little chapel. And then I'm sure the family graves are around the chapel inside the wall. And then the graves outside, my guess is, were slaves, probably household slaves that were very dear to the family. And when I stayed in her guest room, there would always be a procession of people from the 1800s. They were in 1800s dress that would be coming through the room heading towards the chapel. They were dressed in their Sunday best. It was just wild as that happened. And then past lives are so much fun because we can often get information pretty much every time we can get out information that can be corroborated with historical documents online, like, 
you lived in 1913 in Seattle, Washington, and your name was Joe Smith, and you were a logger, and we can go back and we can check census data and and birth and death certificates, and it's really blows people's minds when we get that kind of information that can be corroborated online. It's just so much fun. In the time we have left, let's talk about spirit guides and angels, and what's your experience in communicating with them. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, one of my good friends, Suzanne Wilson says that spirit guides are kind of the unsung heroes of the spirit world because they're always there, always, always, always. And whether we know about it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we believe it or not, they are there. You have a main guide that's with you your whole life. And the best way to connect with spirit guides and angels both is to acknowledge them and ask for their help. That's the thing with this is we have to ask, we have free will. Our spirit guides and angels can't just come in and, you know, dictate our whole life. That's not the point of our life. We have free will. So we, when we want to connect, when we want an answer, when we want to ask a question, when we need help, whatever it is, when we, we need to ask them, we need to open that line of communication and we need to, you know, it never hurts to be grateful and say, thank you to them. Thank you for all that you've done for me and given me. And man, they show up, they do. And, uh, I, my, my relationship with my spirit team, my angels, my spirit guides, all of them has just improved so much. And I've been able to see the messages that they send me so much more clearly when I initiate those conversations with them sometimes daily now. Do they impart information that you've found useful and that you've really been able to integrate into your life? And, and what did you find? Was it a successful integration or was it just something that you thought you'd try and then you moved on? Just tell us a little bit about the communication you've gotten and how you've implemented it. I, I mean, I, as I was trying to say earlier, I'm like my head's blinking on a specific example because I feel like it, at this point in my life, it's, it's constant. It's, it's, it's what I rely on pretty much daily. So uh, I guess the, the big example is back when I got the idea for my company, that, that was me saying I was working in a corporate environment as a writer, as a creative person, feeling stifled, feeling dread going into a fluorescent lit room every day. And it wasn't my jam. And I was praying to my, my team at the, at the time saying, what can I do? Give me a sign. And they gave me that direct download out of nowhere of the name of my company, the tagline of my company and a channeled message of my, basically what became my mission statement. And I had no clue that was not in my head at all. That came directly from source. So that, that was a pretty big example of when they really came through for me. I find that it's really important for people to remember that spirits are very, very literal and they're going to communicate telepathically. So you say something to them, you say something to a deceased loved one or one of your angels or one of your spirit guides, and, and they're going to answer you within a second. If you think about it for longer than a second, that's going to be your brain talking to you. The other thing to remember is they're always going to give you the correct answer. How useful it is, is going to be predicated on how you ask the question. For instance, if you say something like, will I enjoy the movie? And you get a yes, and you're watching some movie on TV this evening, and it's atrocious. And you're thinking, guys, what's up with that? Why would you recommend that I'm going to like this movie? Well, they gave you a correct answer because the way you stated the question could pertain to any movie that you're going to watch for the rest of your life. Versus if you'd asked the question, am I going to enjoy watching Frozen 2 on Disney Plus tonight on TV? See the difference with that? And I think that's really important to remember that they're always going to give us the correct answer. We've just got to be really specific about how we ask the question or ask for guidance. Well, I could talk to you all day about this stuff, but we're to the end of our time together. So tell everybody how they can find you. How can they find your show, your podcast, your book, find you in general? Just give us all of the contact information of how we can learn learn more about what Miss Arizona Bell is doing to make the world a better place. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Julie. I could talk to you all day too. And it's been such a pleasure to spend Thanksgiving 
thanks Thanksgiving evening with you and your listeners. Uh, you can find me easiest places, spiritguidesmedia.com. And that will kind of take you to all of the things that I do, but spiritguidesmedia.com. And then also very active on Instagram at spiritguidesmedia. And also my personal account is at underscore Arizona bell. And that those three places will lead you to pretty much everything that I do. So And when do you do your show? Tell everybody about that. Yes, my show, uh, the podcast is called A Matter of Life and Death with Arizona Bell. You can find it via spiritguidesmedia.com or you can go into iTunes, Spotify, any of those places and type in either Arizona Bell or A Matter of Life and Death with Arizona Bell. That will come up and it comes out weekly on Wednesdays. Okay. And your book is available anywhere. Books are sold. Tell us how we can find your book. Yes. Target, Amazon, the whole shabam, soul magic, ancient wisdom for modern mystics. It's, it's out there. (laughs) Well, thanks for spending Thanksgiving evening with me and all of our listeners. And I just adore you. Everybody go get Arizona's book, listen to her show and Arizona Come visit me in sweet home, Alabama. Sending you lots of love. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.